Welcome back. I'm Muggsy, and today I'm going to explain polyatomic ions. Before we talk about polyatomic ions, it's good that you actually know what an ion is, so make sure you've seen my ions video first. Um, polyatomic ions are exactly what they sound like. It's an ion, or a charged particle, that's made of more than one atom. Poly meaning more than one, atomic meaning atoms. In order to understand what a polyatomic ion is, let's think about water. Now, water, as you'll recall, is just an oxygen. Here's my Lewis structure. And two hydrogens. And they're bonded together to form H2. Oh. Now, if you don't know about the Lewis structure of compounds like this, that's okay. We haven't got to that yet. Um, same thing with covalent bonding. You don't need to know that. You just need to know that it, water is two hydrogens and an oxygen. Okay. Well, sometimes under some conditions, based on the kind of like electrostatic interactions, whatever's interacting with this water molecule, it might actually, something might actually pull this hydrogen off of the water. And in doing so, both of those electrons will go on to the oxygen there, so the oxygen remains stable. The hydrogen now is stable, it has zero electrons. The oxygen is surrounded by eight electrons. But in doing so, since this hydrogen lost an electron, it gains a positive charge and becomes a hydrogen ion. This OH altogether has now gained a negative charge because it now has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight electrons and only, you know, six plus, um, uh, six plus one, seven protons for a total of uh, one extra electron. Okay, so this hydrogen is just a hydrogen ion as we've learned before. That's called a monoatomic ion or you could just call it an ion. And this whole thing here, the OH with a minus charge, is a polyatomic ion. It's made of multiple atoms, an oxygen and a hydrogen together. Polyatomic, more than one atom. Um, and it has a negative charge, so it's an ion, a polyatomic ion. Now, where does this negative charge reside? Is it on the hydrogen? Is it on the oxygen? Well, it's, it's on the whole molecule. It doesn't reside on any one particular element. It's the overall molecule. So the way we often draw this is I would draw out my OH, put brackets around it, and then put a negative charge in the upper uh, right-hand corner. If I were to write out its chemical formula, I would just write out OH and a little minus in the corner just like if I were writing out the chemical formula of a hydrogen ion, I would just do an H with a little plus in the corner. The only difference is more than one atomic symbol here, right? We got oxygen, we got hydrogen. We call this a hydroxide ion. This is definitely not the last time you're going to see a hydroxide ion. The more you progress in your chemistry and biology classes, you're going to see lots and lots of hydroxide. So you might as well start memorizing it now. Now, speaking of memorizing, there are several polyatomic ions that uh, occur quite frequently, and most uh, instructors uh, just require their students to memorize some of the more basic ones. This is because uh, polyatomic ions are kind of hard to predict, um, so it's kind of hard to use our Lewis structures and our knowledge of valence electrons and stuff to predict exactly what the charge of a polyatomic ion is gonna be. So you just kind of need to memorize what those polyatomic ions are and what their charges are. Fortunately, um, instructors like myself only require students to, to memorize a few of them. And the more you use them, the more you'll memorize them. So which ones am I talking about? Here are the six polyatomic ions that I ask my students to memorize. For your particular class, it might be slightly different, and we'll go over some other ones as well. But let's start with these six. Uh, you'll notice only one of the six is a cation, and all the rest are anions. There's a lot of polyatomic anions. There's really only one polyatomic cation that shows up with any regularity, and that's this one, NH4 with a plus one charge. And we call that ammonium. 
You may recognize the name from cleaning products that contain ammonia. They contain ammonium ions. And there's lots of ammonium ionic compounds that are made from ammonium, such as uh, ammonium carbonate, ammonium sulfate, ammonium phosphate, <laughs> ammonium chlorate, ammonium bromate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We'll learn about those later. Um, so NH4 with a plus one charge, that's called ammonia. OH with a minus one charge, we've already seen that one, that's called hydroxide. And hydroxide is actually really easy to remember because it's just a hydrogen and an oxygen. Hydro, ox, and then an ide ending. Hydroxide. Uh, these next ones all are gonna have kind of a similar naming pattern. Maybe you can spot it. NO3 is called nitrate. CO3 with a minus two charge is called carbonate. SO4 with a minus two charge is called sulfate. <laughs> You're probably recognizing the pattern. And PO4 with a three minus charge is called phosphate. Okay, when naming all of these, we basically just take the first syllable, or in some cases, two, the first two syllables, nit, carbon, sulf, and phosph. And then we put on this eight ending. So if it has a nitrogen, nitrate. If it has a carbon, carbonate. If it has a sulfur, sulfate. If it has a phosphorus, phosphate. If it has a chlorine, chlorate. If it has a bromine, bromate, etc., etc., etc. Um, these charges you'll notice are all different. So these first two up here, hydroxide and nitrate, all have a minus one charge, just written out as a negative sign. The next two have a uh, negative two charge written out as two minus. And then the last one, phosphate just has a minus three charge written out as a three minus. Now, uh, there are a lot more polyatomic ions than these, and the naming convention can get pretty tricky. So let's stop here for a moment, take a look at these ones. These are the ones I asked my students to memorize. I'm gonna go on in just a moment and talk about some of the other polyatomic ions and the naming convention. Okay, as you can see, I've written out another group of polyatomic ions next to our first group, and you'll notice some similarities. So we've got nitrate here, NO3, with a negative charge. Here we have NO2 with a negative charge. So the same thing, but with one fewer oxygens. The charge, notice, is the same. We've got carbonate here with a negative two charge. Here we have something, CO2, not carbon dioxide, <laughs> with a negative two charge. Here we have sulfate with a negative two charge. Here we have SO3, so one fewer oxygen. Same thing, still negative two charge. So everything in this column here is the same as everything in this column, but with one less oxygen. And we name these in a very similar manner. So we start with the same way we did last time. Nitro, carbon, sulf, and phosph. What's different now is we no longer use that eight suffix, we now use it. Nitrite, carbonite, sulfite, and phosphite. And so the, the difference between these two groups of polyatomic ions is everything over here in this column has more oxygens than the things over here in this column. So when you're naming these groups of polyatomic ions, the thing that has more oxygens gets the eight ending and the thing with fewer oxygens gets the eight ending. You can't just go by the absolute number of oxygens. Because here you see phosphite is a PO3, so three oxygens gets the it ending. And here you see nitrate, NO3, three oxygens gets the eight ending. So three oxygens doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna be it or eight. That makes it a little bit more confusing. What does matter is just the comparison between the two. So if you look at phosphate and phosphite, 
PO4 has more, so we call that phosphate. PO3 has less, so we call that phosphite. phosphite. Uh, if we look at, again, nitrate and nitrite, NO3 versus NO2, 3 is more than 2, so the one with 3 gets the 8 ending, and the one with 2 gets the ite ending. So again, it's not the absolute number of oxygens that determine whether it's going to get the ite or 8 ending. It's just um, the difference in oxygens between the two forms. I know this can be really confusing. It certainly was for me when I first learned this. Um, I would say focus on these suffixes, the ite versus the 8. Again, the prefix is easy. That's just the first part of the uh, uh, atomic name, right? Like nitrogen, carbon, sulfur, phosphorus, etc. Um, it's the eight versus eight that can be a little bit tricky. And if you look at the two forms, you can kind of compare them. Uh, most of these eights are less common than the eights. That's why I ask my students to just remember the eights. Um, but there are quite a few ites that pop out there in nature and chemistry and stuff. For instance, I use a lot of sulfate fights in uh, home winemaking and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, that's one thing to consider when naming these polyatomic ions. The other thing I just want to point out one more time is that the charges are actually the same. So nitrate, uh, nitrate and nitrite have different amounts of oxygen, but they both have a negative one charge. Phosphate and phosphite, again, different amounts of oxygen, four versus three, but they still have a negative three charge. So the charge doesn't change. And again, um, if you were my student, I would just be asking you to, to memorize these eights. Okay, um, so hydroxide, nitrate, carbonate, sulfate, phosphate, and then NH4 with a plus charge, which we call ammonium. Uh, you'll notice with the NH4, we don't call that ammonate. We call that ammonium. And that's because eights are usually for suffixes, things that come at the end of a name. And um, uh, you'll recall from basic ionic bonding that uh, cations, positively charged ions, go first in the name and the anions go second. So if I had ammonium bonded with hydroxide, ammonium's got a plus one charge, hydroxide's got a negative one charge. So ammonium would go first in the name, ammonium, and we write it out just as we would here, and then we put hydroxide. And that would be the name of this compound. If we had ammonium and phosphate bonded together, we would need three ammoniums to every one phosphate. We'll talk about that in a later video. We would call that ammonium phosphate. And it's just that easy. We'll do just one last example with the halogens to really understand how to name these polyatomic anions, such as sulfate, phosphate, etc. Here you'll see ClO2 with a minus charge and ClO3 with a minus charge. Take a moment, remember everything I just talked about, and see if you can name these two polyatomic ions. Okay, if you said the one with more oxygens is chlor eight, you're correct. And the one with less oxygens, we're gonna call that chlor eight. Oops, let's use a different color for that. Chlorite. Remember, the more oxygens, it gets the eight suffix, fewer gets the eight suffix. Okay, now with these halogens, the elements in column uh, 7a of the periodic table, or 17, there are even more versions of the polyatomic ions uh, other than 8 and ite, but we'll talk about those in just a moment. Let me give you one more example first. What if we had bromine and oxygen together with a negative 1 charge, and bromine and oxygen together, with a negative one charge, but this one has three and this one has two. Well, the one with less we would call brom... What would you call it? Ite. And the one with more we would call brom... Eight.
Okay, if it feels like I'm beating a dead horse, it's because I'm really trying to make this sink in. Fewer oxygens eight, more oxygens eight. But every now and then, <laughs> you might see something like this. One with even fewer oxygens, just one oxygen in this case. Or something with even fewer oxygens here, again, just one oxygen instead of two. Now, what do you use, eight or eight? Well, you can't use eight for fewer because it's already taken. So if there's an even smaller one than eight, you use hypo first. Uh, and just like hypo means less than or under or fewer, uh, if you were hypoglycemic, you don't have enough blood sugar, for example. If you were hypoactive, not hyperactive, hypoactive, that would mean you're really sluggish and tired. Okay, so we would just call this hypochlorite. Less than chlorite. Even less oxygen than chlorite. And we would call this hypo bromite. Even fewer oxygens than bromite. Okay, that's a little extra. <laughs> um, and this doesn't come up all that much, but what if every now and then there's one that has even more oxygens than chlorate, ClO4, and even more oxygens than bromate, BrO4. They both still just have a negative one charge. In fact, all of these have the same charge, negative one. Okay, in this case, we use per in front. I don't know the root of that per, why we use per. It's just something to remember. It's, it's not as easy as hypo. Hypo makes a lot of sense. So this would be per chlorate, and this would be per bromate. So this might not come up in your chemistry class at all, but later on in chemistry, we have so many polyatomic ions, you'll start to see hypo things and per things. Again, I ask my students just to focus on these two middle columns, eight and eight, but you could um, keep your eyes out for things like hypochlorite or uh, permanganate or things like that. Okay. Um, I know that was a lot about polyatomic ions. Really, the only thing I ask my students to do at this point is just memorize those, uh, I think it was six that I showed a little while earlier. Um, in my next video, I'll talk about how to actually bond these polyatomic ions to make polyatomic ionic compounds. And hopefully this will all start to make a lot more sense then. For now, I would just focus on the, that memorization, do flashcards, whatever you need to do. It won't take long, it's only six things. And um, the more you actually use these guys in chemistry and you go along with stoichiometry and all the other things that in your chemistry class, you'll just memorize a bunch of these. Okay, um, I hope that helped. I'll see you next time.